You're listening to the Crochet Conversations podcast with Ines and Mel, and this is episode 53, a behind-the-scenes look at our local art markets, part one. Oh my goodness, guys, hello and welcome back. <laughs> to another episode. I've never been so happy to say that. Right, yeah. Hi, every everybody. Wow, it's, <laughs> it's just been, been such a long time. It's been so incredibly crazy long since yeah. I feel like we've sat down. Yeah. Um, I hope that we still can get back in the groove in of the it. Groove, yeah. So, as you can see from today's episode title, this is going to be a two-part series. Yeah. Or... Knowing us, it might be a three-part series, I don't know. But we're going to talk all about behind the scenes of our local art market. Yes. And the reason we decided to do that is because, you know, you guys know that we recently had an event at Public Garden. And it's actually something we've been um, asked a lot. Mm-hmm. What goes on behind the scenes? How is it like? Is it is it messy? Is it crazy? Is it yeah. easy? Yeah, yeah. So, People are interested. Yeah, so we decided that. This week, we're going to finally talk about it, especially since the previous event just happened. So it's kind of still like fresh in our minds. Yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do that... Some updates. I feel like we've got a ton of updates for you guys. Firstly, I we're so sorry that we haven't been... Uh, like meeting up with you guys via our weekly episodes. It's just been a really crazy month, would you say month? It's been a crazy past four weeks for us. So if you guys came down to our public garden event, I bet a lot of you didn't see me. Right? Yeah. (laughs) And I feel like I've been promoting like, oh, we'll be there, come say hi. And then when you guys did go down, I... Inez wasn't there. The yeah. crochet, <laughs> the crochet designer. designer artist was not there. So Mel had to handle this whole event on her own, which is yeah. wonderful. And thank you so much for doing that. You're welcome. And I just hope that uh, most of you guys were not disappointed to not, you know, <laughs> see Inez there. Uh, I had a, like quite a, a number of explanation to do, you know, mm-hmm. to explain that, you know, because you weren't feeling well. So unfortunately, you. You yeah. couldn't come down, yeah. So let me explain why I wasn't there. Basically, as Mel just said, I wasn't feeling well. I was starting to feel really, like, fluish, not feeling well. I, I had no fever or anything, but it's just I was uncomfortable. And in the spirit of uh, being safe, I went home midway on, on the first day. Yeah. So I was there to help with the setup on the first day. Uh, then I stayed for a couple hours and then I decided at some point that I need to go home because I'm feeling worse. Yeah. And I shouldn't be out, you know, with COVID flying around. Yeah, for sure. That I should go home and stay isolated from everybody. So that's what I did. And then Mel, <laughs> wonderful partner of mine, had yeah. to do all of it alone. And, you know, it's it's just a mark of how sick I was or maybe that's how much I trust you, but I didn't really bother you or text you or... Yeah, oh. I was the one that was giving you... Updates. Uh, yeah, a number of updates during the whole the whole event. Yeah, and this is kind of like the first event back in Singapore. Yeah. So, uh, Singapore is only just opening up from COVID restrictions. Yeah. So, this is the first event back. So, a lot of like people came really down. Like a really big event, yeah. Yeah, like my cousins. Uh, two of my cousins, one from each side of the family came down, one of whom I've not seen in a decade, literally a decade. And I didn't see them. <laughs> Well, I did um, take a number of photos you yeah, know, to, yeah, yeah. to show you that they were there and they were missing you and uh, they were just, you know... Wanting you know, to come wanting by to come and by say, say hi. Yeah. hi. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's what happened. So if any of you from Singapore came down to this event, I'm so sorry that you didn't see me and I would have loved to be there but I was just really... I was really unwell. I just yeah. wasn't feeling good. Yeah. So I think I had like an upper respiratory tract infection so I think it's you know, when you don't know what it is, it's better to just stay away with or without COVID. If you're not feeling well, you yeah, should exactly. just stay home anyway, right? Yeah, for sure. So that's what happened. So then we came back, um, I recovered, we went back to normal, uh, and then we left for Kuala Lumpur. So that's, I think in the previous episode, a couple episodes ago, we did we some did updates. Mention, yeah. yeah, that we're going to go away on a work trip so we did we went to Kuala Lumpur for a week and the reason we were there was because we were looking for some yarn suppliers but unfortunately none of them worked out it's just a lot cheaper to get it in Singapore 
and a lot of the materials just wasn't up to my standard of yeah. what I was willing to put in my shop. So that didn't happen. But it was a nice week away. Yeah, for sure. And then it's just, you know, it's like one thing after another. So it's really crazy. And so we didn't have an episode for two weeks. Yeah, and also because the the public garden event that, that just happened, mm-hmm. we had a lot of custom orders as well. That's true. So we were pretty busy with that. Yeah. yeah, and in fact, we had so many orders that because I, because I wasn't there, I had to sort of read the notes that Mel took. Because we have like a custom order <laughs> form, right? I had to kind of read the notes and read what Mel has written down for me. And then I had to sort of just go based on what was on the paper. So I never really got a chance to speak to the customers who made their custom orders. Yeah. So it did take a little bit longer than usual for me to get them out to them. Yeah. And in fact, we only dispatched... Um, them to the courier service after we came back from KL but you know it's all been sent out and so all is good and well but yeah it's just it's been a crazy m- month yeah for there's, sure there's no other way no yeah, other way to see I see. think yeah that's a problem if you're unwell you can't really anticipate when you're gonna get well either so you know and you're kind of stuck you know because you can't do anything much you know when you're not well that's true and also this is a like a small business problem yeah. as long as one person is not feeling good Especially if that person is the crochet <laughs> artist, you kind of, the whole business kind of stalls. Yeah. And that's the issue with, you know, not just, not just, I mean, I said small business, but it's really like handmade small yeah, business. Yeah, crafters, yeah. Yeah, so when you're actually the one doing the work and you're sick, you also shouldn't be sitting home and crocheting when you are sick. You know, you should not be touching the products at all. Yeah. So that was a difficult thing that we had to try to manage because I don't think I've been sick in a long time. Mm-hmm. So this was, this this really kind of affected our business timeline a little bit. Yeah. But that's all in the past and we're back here today with another episode. <laughs> yeah. Now the second announcement that we're going to make um, is one that I we've been struggling over, that I have been struggling with for a while and we've wanted to implement this into our podcast for quite some time already. It's just that you know, I felt bad and I felt that there were a lot of you guys who were sort of counting on it to happen every week. Yeah. But like I said, given with given the health scare or like sickness that I've gone through recently, I've decided that we need to slow down on it because having a podcast episode every week is really quite... It takes up a lot more time than you think. Yeah. And in fact, it takes up almost the whole week to sort of think about an episode, to plan, um, to write the outline, to do research. And sometimes these are not things that can be done all in one day. Yeah. So it's really like a week-long affair to then record an episode, edit, have it be put up, and then repeat the cycle again. Yeah. So here's the announcement. After the episode this week... The next episode will be the following week. Yes. And that will kind of be the routine that we will take from now on uh, in the second year of our podcast. Yeah. So, which means that every two weeks, that will be when an episode will be released instead of every week. And the reason we've decided to do that is because we think after having one year's worth of episodes I think we've covered a lot of information and we are starting to run the risk of not having enough topics to talk about or and I don't want it to come to a point where we're just searching for you know regular random topics to talk about instead of having really good quality ones exactly so that is the issue right we also do need more time to kind of plan and research and make sure that we are not doing a rush job Mm -hmm. I think you know trying to catch up and do the week Weekly the weekly, podcast, yeah. So uh, it's, like how we've planned, yeah. It's you know we're fi- we're finding that we are sort of chasing the week instead, yeah. instead of having the podcast. Like we're really excited to plan it. Not that we're not excited to record the episodes every week, but I think having it in a two week interval would give us a little bit of time to rest, give us a little bit of time to plan and record and look for episodes that we really really want to cover and yeah. not just like oh 10 quick tips you know yeah. and just how many quick exactly. tips can you have yeah. so yeah and also like i said given the recent health scare i think it gives us a little bit more time to step back and sort of look at the overall arc of where our episodes are heading and whether we like the way it's being you know produced yeah. and maybe we should be updating our music or you right. know like think about bigger things rather than just chasing the episode week after week yeah definitely and we are getting busier you mm-hmm. have uh, had a lot of inquiries about your classes as well. Mm-hmm. So that takes up 
like majority of your time and I think rest is important especially yeah, true. Like, if we have something planned like the the, the art market again mm-hmm. you know we don't want you to tire yourself out before you're able to do you know something like that yeah I must say that the week leading up to the art market that we had was really insane because we had to have an episode up yeah. it had to be pre-recorded so a lot, of, a lot of the times we are recording two episodes in one week and that is really insane and we feel like okay let's give ourselves one or two days and before you know it's like Wednesday and we <laughs> yeah. record we record every Friday and then episodes go out every Sunday so it's it's just it's it's a mm. real rush yeah so after having 52 episodes we've kind of given ourselves like one year of trying one episode every week and I think we you know it's about time we sort of pat ourselves on the back you know yeah. tell ourselves that we did a good job and now we can maybe pull back a little a bit little bit, yeah. so like I said I think it's more sustainable in the long run and I really want to be continuing making these episodes for a long time more so in order to do that we kind of want to stretch out also the topics we cover and maybe go in more in depth which is why you know if you guys have noticed a lot of the episodes are part ones and part two nowadays yeah you know initially when we first started it was just one and done episode types yeah. but now we have so much more to talk about you guys are interacting with us you know we have things to refer back with you guys and the more episodes we have under our belt the more things we refer to and then the longer and longer each episode goes yeah so with that said though if you guys have any ideas for future episodes that you think will be good for us because it's just me and Mel in this and that's only so much our brains can come up with. Yeah. So if you guys can help us come up with episodes or think that there are things that we should cover, please, please, please send them our way. Yeah, and because it's just the two of us, it's just two brains, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes you guys share something that either, you know, none of us have thought about thought before about, yeah. and it's actually a really interesting topic. Yeah, you know, and so. so many of our topics were actually recommended by yeah. you guys. Yeah. Not, not really that you said, hey, do this. But it was more inspired by the conversations that you, uh, that we have with some of you guys listening. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. So that's that's a really long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so we can go we right can, into yeah, it I now? Think, yeah. I think it's time we start the episode. Okay, I'm so sorry. Let's begin this episode. So, behind the scenes of a local art market. And... You know, we really want to share everything. There will be no gatekeeping in this episode. We're going to share every little thing down to how our process is like. We're going to share numbers. We're going to share prices. We're going to share how much we actually earn per event. Per event, yeah. Um, how much we pay you to be a part of this event and what the, the sort of like general feel and, you know, our conclusion of whether it's worth it or not. And in the next episode we'll talk about the pros the cons and some of our more well would you say like memorable experiences experiences yeah uh, that would also encompass some of the best and worst experiences moments of the event yeah i would have to say though that a lot more a lot of our more memorable experiences are quite (laughs) negative ones (laughs) Bad experiences, yeah. Most but, of the time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are the ones that people would would remember, right? But, yeah. you know, it's kind of sort of added to the experience and I am appreciative of all our experiences. Yeah. I guess for me, I take it as a learning experience. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, because we are definitely going to do more fleas in the future. So any, like, bad experience, I would say, you know... It's also a learning experience. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I am right there with you because we started this journey together, right? Yeah. It's not like I did it on my own first and then Mel joined me, but we really made this decision together. So it was, you know, it's nice to have somebody struggle with you. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to compare, definitely struggling together is better than struggling alone, right? For sure. So we, I totally feel you when you say it's about the learning experience because, boy, do, do we go through some, yeah, like, crazy yeah. learning. Yeah, like, the next time we're going to do this, this is, we're going to make sure this is not going to happen again. Yeah. yeah. So I think that where we are now with doing events is we are super efficient. I mean... We, there are areas that we could improve on but I think for the most part we are quite efficient with what we have and I will share this whole process with you and sort of what we've done to make life a lot easier for us um, because you know it's two, three months prior to an event that we are planning for it already. And prepping and you know all the preparation that goes into it yeah. Yep. Yeah. so the whole process to actually 
take part in an art market is not too difficult, but creatively, it's a lot more chaotic than it is. So we've decided to break this episode up into a few parts. So the first portion would be to explain the art market scene in Singapore and what it really feels like. And you know, it just occurred to me that it would be quite interesting if you are not from Singapore. And we do have a lot of listeners who are not from Singapore to see how the process is like here because yeah. I think it's very different. It from, is very different, yeah. Yeah, for like, say, when I was working in Australia, I think the process was really, really different there too. So we're going to share what it's like in Singapore. We're going to share the different uh, organizers, uh, events that we have. Also, the prices or how much it takes to join an event. Uh, we're going to give you those numbers. And then the next part, we're going to talk about our process. So who does what? in which section of our, you know, yeah. our behind the scenes. So there are certain, the workload is kind of split between Mel and I, which we will get into that a little bit later. So let's talk about um, the feel of art markets here. I think in Singapore in general, because we're such an urban place, like we're such an urban country, yeah. there really is no such thing as a farmer's market. Yeah, there isn't. Shocking, Surprisingly, right? yeah. There is nowhere that you can go that would have any version. Like I'm trying to think now. Like, yeah, there is absolutely no version of a farmer's market because Singapore is so small. You could drive literally from one end of the country to the other country and not see a field, a public field, bigger than a football field. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, even half the size. Half okay, the size, to find yeah. To find a, a patch of grass... That is the size of a basketball court. Would you say that's better? Yeah. It's quite impossible. You see like one or two or three. but it's... There probably is, but it's really far away, like in the far corner of, yeah, you know, but I see kind it... of undeveloped. Yeah. yeah, so my point of view is that if you drive from one side to the other on any of the major roads, or even in the side neighbourhood roads, you would never see a no. place like that. Yeah. You have to really go really far out in the industrial estate where no one ever lives there, no one... I mean, people work there, but they, yeah. nobody lives there. There's just, just It just doesn't exist. We don't have land to farm. Yeah. <laughs> we buy, we import most of our fresh produce from the neighbouring country, that's Malaysia. Um, even a lot of our water is imported from Malaysia. Yeah. So Singapore has really very little... Um, natural, natural resources. resources yeah, yeah, natural resources. What we do have is like a really good um, import-export system. So that's what Singapore uses. So for that reason, uh, farmer's markets are not a thing. And so it's only, I think, in the past maybe 20 years or so, would you say, that art markets really, you know, started growing. Mm, And it really came from flea markets. So we used to have, in Singapore, this this is like maybe 20 years ago, we had some flea markets. There was like one... It was really one or two main one or two, yeah. de- designated areas where you could have like an actual flea market. And that's really where people go like thrifting. Yeah, uh, mostly s- selling secondhand stuff. Yeah, like old stuff, things that barely work or, you know, one or two maybe very small like handmade leather stuff yeah. or people who upcycle old things. Mm-hmm. Uh, like the rag and bone man who would yeah. you know, buy old things and then resell them, at, you know, clean yeah. them up and resell. Yeah, I think then that was the purpose of flea yeah. market. Yeah. So in the past 20 years, they have gotten rid of a lot of these sort of markets because they need the land space to uh, develop because Singapore is a really, really small country. We could, you know, we, I, we could literally go around <laughs> the island within half a day. Yeah. That's how small we are. But we are a really metropolitan place and we have a lot of really big buildings. So they are constantly tearing down old heritage places like that and yeah. rebuilding new buildings. So along with that, all the old flea markets and thrift yeah, stores, areas where you th- used to be able to to set up all this is this area yeah. is gone. They're yeah. gone. So I think in its place, people started curating more. Like they started offering. They wanted to bring this feeling back. So I think, and this is just from my observation, I think what happened was independent people began saying, "We miss that vibe where you could just walk down the street and in the shop along some thrift lanes." Yeah. So let's bring that back. You know, now where are we going to find second-hand stuff, old stuff to sell? So they started approaching people who did, who did like, uh, handmade, handmade stuff. Yeah. 
you know, and that was really like hobbyists and all, and that's how it really started. And then it kind of grew and grew and grew until now we have big art market conventions here. Yeah. So if you come to Singapore and you ask and you tell them, oh, what's the, you know, next art market, a lot of them are not going to understand because the term that we use here in Singapore are flea markets. But you know, flea markets is just a general term. People actually are referring to art markets, but they don't use that term. Yeah. They just say flea markets because that's where it begins. But, you know, it's not really a flea market. Exactly, it's yeah. It's just an art market. So, that's the general feel of it. Um, and how we get involved is there are a few ways you can do it. You can either approach organizers and these people would be in collaboration or they would work with different parties like maybe like some malls or maybe some locations or certain streets that are legally licensed to have such outdoor activities. Yeah. Or you could approach the events itself. So there are some, there is just one organizer who only handles one event and we will give you some examples of that. So let's start with individual events that you can say look forward to if you're thinking about in terms of art markets and the most popular one I would say is public garden yeah. which is what we've been talking about so in the last episode we explained that public garden is sort of like a Asia Pacific a regional curation of local artists and they have a really really high standard of who they allow in and who they allow to be a part of this yeah, the this participating brand yeah yeah so you have to have a really strong handmade element to it. So you have to be designing and making your own things. You They don't even allow you to have your stuff manufactured by a third party, even if you are a designer. I think there are some loopholes around this. Uh, like, for example, like enamel pins, you have to yeah. be the artist behind the designs or I think like stickers or something along those lines. Yeah. But you have to be involved in it and they vet you. Uh, and it's like a two, three week process from the time that you submit your application to the time that they approve you. Yeah. And if they don't approve you, they just don't even reply. Yeah. So, so you just don't don't get a spot. And yeah. Yeah, I think they're a little bit snobbish, I would have to say. But right, like they have a right to be because they are just so selective and so protective about the kind of brands they allow in, which I think is good in general if you you know that whenever you buy something at a public garden event, you know you're getting it's something. It's definitely going to be handmade. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. The quality is really, really good. And it's all regional places. Like, there's people from Taiwan, from yeah. China, from Indonesia, yeah. from and Hong Kong. It's exactly why I think that sports are so limited. Yeah. Because it's a regional thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the number, even though it's being held in Singapore, yeah. the number of sports, you know, you would say to it's select really the limited, local yeah. people. It, yeah. Yeah, and we pay about four hundred dollars. Yeah, almost four hundred. Yeah, almost four hundred. And the number, this n this number has been steadily increasing over the past five years or so, and uh, they, it's only open from like one p.m. to seven p.m. Yes. So this four hundred dollars is over a weekend for six hours a day. So Mel and I were doing the math, which means that we have to earn about thirty dollars every hour. Oh, yeah. In order to you know. To, to cover, cover this, just the cost yeah. alone. And I would say that the crowd in Singapore is very selective. Because we are such like a global, tiny but global country, it's very easy to get things from anywhere else. So I think the local Singaporean crowd are quite um, picky customer base. It's quite difficult to have things to appeal to them, or at least yeah. that's my perspective. They're a little bit fussier about the things, the handmade things they buy. The yeah. idea of quality is really, really high. Which yeah, expectation-wise, yes. Yeah, yeah, which then places a lot of stress on makers like us. But then again, Public Garden is sort of like the number one place or event that you want yeah. to be a part of. Especially if, uh, as a handmade artist, you mm -hmm. want to be one of the brands that they recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, in, like in general right yeah so we're very lucky to have uh, been approved by the vetting process and we've been doing this public garden since 2018 or 2019 so it's it's been a while uh this public garden is held three times a year yeah usually usually yeah. one in april uh one in september i think or july september and yeah. one more in for December. the Christmas, yeah. yeah. So it's the Christmas market that that's in. I think it's usually late November, start December. So 
that's that's the number one and that's really the only one we do anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're so picky with our events as well that's really the only one we really do yeah or at least we we make we make sure that that it's yeah. something that we participate in every every year and let me tell you we we only break even every year and that's like kind of the reality of it i would love to tell you that i can earn maybe triple or whatever but the kind of things we have uh crochet for example we we barely break even sometimes uh on the better years we break like for example on christmas yeah when we have the christmas market we will break even only at the end of the first day and it's a two day event so you know it's it's not a lot of profit yeah, sometimes it's just just the way it is like yeah. you mentioned just now you know customers expectations are getting yeah. uh, like higher and you know they're very selective about oh do you have this in another color or do you have this in a different size but the jewelry brands and the fashion brands do better yeah so i always say why can't i be doing jewelry instead <laughs> you know, i should be doing that <laughs> because they just they just seem to have they always have a crowd around yeah. them you know but the good thing about our brand or crochet at least is that there are not many crochet brands doing what we do in Singapore at least um a lot of the crochet brands here are amigurumi which yeah. i do not do so, so i'm not in direct competition with yeah, them we we stand out in a different way yeah and so the people who come back to us are quite loyal which we are you know very appreciative yeah. of okay so let's so let's move on the next event that is like a one off event is also it's called Etsy Craftivist yep yeah. which we were a part of was it last year i think it was last year or was it the year before i think i yeah. think i think it was last year because i remember it was after covid and we had to wear mask so right. Etsy Craftivist is held it's created by an independent uh, group so it's actually a couple of makers who came together which we have the honor of of being friends with and they they came together and they decided that they need more of these like public garden events like we need more of that yeah. so they it's it's a mom and she does like sewing quilting things i think her brand is called the cotton shop so she does lots of sewing um stitching embroidery and like custom machine embroidery with names and whatnot so she and a few other people came together and they hold this Etsy craft of every year uh the problem with Etsy craft of is because they're independent you know organizing organize a brand organize a team <laughs> yeah they don't have as much uh pull or bargaining power with the different locations and most of the time uh these events are held in either convention centers in Singapore or like a mall but like the outdoor atrium area of a mall yeah. so they collaborate with the malls uh so Etsy Craftivist i think when they first started being held in Singapore the participation fee was about $600 uh i think but i think you're allowed to share a booth oh yes yeah they do have the option where you you can share with another brand yeah because they are they are makers right so they understand it's difficult to fork out $600 yeah. alone for 2 days or maybe i think it was 3 days but $600 is really really steep yeah it and is so, really steep so you know the price you know i i would tell you the general pricing of each market um uh, and it can start from $250 for a weekend up to $2500 and that's Singapore dollars. So that's that's the first two. Oh, another event is Artbox. Yeah. So Artbox is actually a Thailand it's it's from Thailand yeah, and it Artbox, started from Thailand, yeah. Yeah. And so the organizers they are Thai and they are they have a really big following in Thailand. Uh and then one of the years they came to Singapore and they were looking for people and it was two weekends back to back and we paid about $800. Oh yes, yeah. Singapore dollars, dollars yeah. you know. So and we at that time we were still small enough that we had to put in our own money and yeah. it's not just from the business. Yeah. You know, our business barely had any money then and we had to put our own money to try to get this to happen. Yeah. And it was held in this really big uh parking lot space. and they just section out this whole parking space. Yeah. The, the thing about uh, art box is different from the other art market is that they have F&B, they they sell food, mm-hmm. drinks. It's like a really big um um space yeah. where you have like different different things, different mm-hmm. stores selling things. So all the other uh, events that we talked about is only purely uh 
like retail booths. Yeah. So there's exactly. no food, and you know you can bring food in, but there are no food stalls because it's it's expensive. I think to purchase the license for that. But Artbox is humongous. It's humongous, yeah. You know, and so they have a, an area that's all food. There is an area that's all handcrafted stuff, and I think there is an, another area that is all just seating for people to sit and chill. And another area that is like a couple of workshop spaces. Yeah. And it was really nice because they put, you know, they section out these areas with big containers. So they converted these like shipping containers into like yeah. lounge areas exactly, and yeah. workshop areas. I think that one of the years there was like a perfumery workshop space with a local brand there. So if you had gone to Artbox, there would have been a lot of local and Thai designers, yeah. which was wonderful because we actually made friends with one of the leather makers, and initially they were who were making our leather bases or leather um, portions of like our crochet bags. So that's another one of the events. Another one worth mentioning is uh, this place called Curbs, Curbside Crafters. And when we did the Etsy Craftivist event or art market with them recently, they held it at this location which is called Curbside Crafters. Crafters yeah. And Curbside Crafters is a really, really new location. So it's basically, uh, it's like a retail store. It's two levels. It's inside a building, but they have converted these two levels of building into you know, like a like an art market. Like a space like where a space, you can yeah. sort of rent to, to have your art market there. Yeah. And I think they are in the midst of setting up a third floor because they own they, they sort of rented the building. Yeah. So on the third level, I think they was they were the last they mentioned they were gonna do workshop spaces. So yep. there are a spaces you can rent to hold your art workshops there if that's what you want. So we did that with them recently, but they're not really they're really managing the location uh, and not so much managing the event. Yeah. So you have to do your own marketing when it comes to that. They don't help with marketing because they are not curbside crafters. Is a location and not really, um, you know, like a big event that's happening. Yeah. They are open every day of the year and brands that are there get to pay to be there for either a week, two weeks or a month. I think yeah. that was how they broke it down. So that's another one. Um, another like art market that is that we should note that no longer exists is the Mad Market. Yeah, the Mad Market. The, M A A D. Yeah, the Mad Market was one of my favorite markets to do. M A A D stands for Market of Artists and Designers, and it was what Public Garden is now. It used to be what yeah. Public Garden is now. Yeah. Let me it was face one it of correctly. Those uh, initial art markets that yes. were that really started this whole um, uh, having local handmade crafters mm-hmm. coming together yeah. and and you know having a market and, and they, a community. Yeah. And the best part is that they were held uh, every other Sunday of the month, I think, uh, and they were held at the National Design Center. Yeah. So it really feels like you know something. It feels fun and feels nice as a as an artist to be yeah. having like an event at the National Design Centre and it was a really really big thing you know they had local uh, I think there was food there as well I remember one of the years uh, I was there as a visitor not participating this was way before Cricket Crochet ever existed um, but I went as a visitor one year and there was this fella doing crafted marshmallows whoa yeah so he he make he makes his own marshmallows and he skewers them and <laughs> torches them wow and adds like different flavors and so he came up with really interesting flavor combinations and yeah that was his brand you know like experimenting with flavors and food and visual and texture yeah. so yeah. and you know it was people like this there you know and there were local designers who stitched their own make their own clothes yeah. everything is handmade i think i bought like a a necklace there one year there was another brand local brand who does like really natural um like dry shampoo and like oh. body, like deodorant uh, and bar soap basically they are like the ghetto version of lush right? at that <laughs> yeah, time at that time yeah yeah but i really love their dry shampoo and they are some of their their tooth 
toothpaste tablets and yeah. you know and they're all handmade locally yeah. so that was what was yeah. great I think when I went oh, and I mean obviously not as a vendor as well mm-hmm. uh, I was most interested in the artisanal food oh right and, and different kind of beverage <laughs> that they had I think that was really interesting because you don't see those like mm-hmm. out there in the more commercial mm-hmm. areas yeah uh, there was one year that you and I went together mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember but there was this local artist who took um, potato chips packets and oh, turned yes. them into bags so I don't know how he does it but he takes potato chips packets or instant you know, noodle packets food wrappers yeah. uh, and then he laminates them in some sort of plastic and turns them into bags which was so interesting because you know it, it looks like a food packet so <laughs> yeah. it looks like a, like a ruffles or lace potato chips you know but with a zip yeah. and with a strap so it was really cute it was like only going for like 10 to 20 30 dollars yeah. per bag yeah so we bought some to support for yeah. sure so that was one uh, event but Matt is no longer see the thing is I don't know if it's no longer available like it just it's not it doesn't exist anymore yeah or if we've just been out of the circle for so long yeah I, when I do try to search information for you know the, a Matt event I, mm-hmm. I guess they some for some reason can't uh, they find are, any they yeah. are kind of put on hold for now yeah don't really I know think, why I think the downfall of this mad market really came when the National Design Center yeah. closed down and moved. Right. So the old National Design Center was held in a really old heritage colonial building. Yeah. Um, and it's basically you walk along this old English mansion and they turn the interiors into um, like different sections they, they rent out to artists. And so basically walking in the National Design Center any given time was just an experience on its own yeah but they this was in the middle of like the central business district so i think they wanted to move them out and move this design center into the arts district right 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 which is um closer to all the museums and whatnot yeah and put them all together yes yeah Yeah. so they moved them out and then mad had no home yeah probably that that could be the main reason why so they were sort of um floating around looking for locations and they they just couldn't find any and then COVID came and then they sort of never really got back or I don't know at least that's from my point of view like there is no I've not heard anything about it I think there is a possibility they might come back Um, so I think for now we just have to keep on waiting yeah keep a lookout on them they don't even have an Instagram page or a Facebook page that's how like independent local they are so okay, so that's another one. Um, I'm gonna talk about two more places that are worth mentioning, uh, but they're not exactly art markets per se. But I just I feel like it's important for me to talk about them, so you guys listening have an idea of sort of the like the climate of art markets. I can't really explain <laughs> yeah. it. So let me just go straight into it. There is this event called the Boutiques Fair, mm-hmm. and the boutiques fair, let me straight up and say, costs two thousand dollars to be a part of one weekend. Yep. And you didn't hear that wrongly. Two thousand Singapore dollars. It's yeah, not two hundred, but two thousand. And the boutiques fair is run by. It's usually held at some British club or whatever, and it's. How do I explain this? I have such difficult feelings when it comes to the boutiques fair because they are really fussy or they're really particular about the brands they put in more so than Public Garden but I feel like unlike Public Garden who really who really cares about things being handmade and you know supporting the artists and giving like makers like us a space to showcase our things Boutiques Fair focuses a lot more on the aesthetics of things yeah. so you have to submit your things and if your stuff doesn't look nice enough or glossy enough they don't let you be a part of it yeah. they even ask for the layout of your table and if you don't have a fancy setup they will say no to you yeah. they don't there's a specific look they like so if your brand has a lot of wood or a lot of like raw elements they don't like that they like the nice high end boutique sleek stuff so, and it's really confusing why they think they can charge two thousand dollars for, for yeah. an event that happens yeah. once a year. Because a lot of I don't know how anybody ever earns that amount back. It's insane, yeah. two thousand dollars. So let me give you an example of 
some of the things that are there. Uh, they have a really, really high price point, of course. You know, one necklace could be a hundred to hundred dollars. Yeah, easily, yeah. They have a, they have a lot of like perfume, local perfume and like candle brands that sell like a small yeah. fifty ml candle for fifty dollars. Yeah, a lot of uh, leather leather stuff as well. I leather think. bags, yeah. yeah, because that's expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, they're high end prices stuff, you know. And it at some point, um, it feels really superficial mm-hmm. I I think that's I think I'm allowed to say that <laughs> um, I have been for one boutique fair once and the people there are really snobbish as well and they charge entrance fee for customers to go in yeah. they didn't know? used to though Yeah, this is like a recent recent post-covid thing I think yeah. but before that it was free for anybody to walk in which is when I did it uh, not as a vendor but as a participant so the things that are really like you pick anything up like a smallest thing and you can bet your ass it's fifty dollars <laughs> you know yeah and I think I think it's only priced that that amount because it's so high end yeah. and so boutiques fair used to be like a mid range luxury kind of things yeah. where one bag could be five hundred dollars but exactly. they're made by independent people which fine it gives you that platform mm-hmm. but over time they stop checking if you are handmade or not so there are a lot of people who I've seen they just buy things or have not made elsewhere then put it there right. just because it's packaged nicely it's a lot of gimmicky packaging and a lot of fancy uh boxes and you know yeah. wrappings yeah. and then they allow you to put it there they have a specific look when you walk in everything is like white and gold and marble it's like yeah. it's, it's a specific look but they like to claim that they are like an artisanal yeah. fair and over time or at least that's what I've noticed they are just allowing spaces to brands that are already established and sort of have a retail store somewhere and they allow them to put their things there as sort of you know another way for them to promote for them to market their yeah. stuff yeah but I feel like that's that's like hogging a, a space yeah. you know I, I can't explain it but boutiques fair basically if you are part of it there's a like there's a likelihood that you would be your brand would kind of be seen as the more pretentious brands which you know on top of the price being two thousand yeah. dollars it's just really it's really sad I think yeah I, I agree I couldn't agree more really yeah, so that's one. Now there's this other place in Singapore called Design Singapore. And Design Singapore, I think it was launched by... It's an initiative launched by the government or the Arts Council where they wanted to give um, mid to well-established local brands mm-hmm. a space to shine. So this is sort of similar to what I described with Boutiques Fair, but... Uh, it's a little bit nicer. The, the feels a little bit nicer. It's less pretentious. Um, they really give, you know, like spaces to local brands who have already sort of made it a little bit and just need a little bit more push, or they want to raise awareness to some of the bigger brands that yeah. we see in malls, and you don't know if they are local or not. So it's not really about the handmade element, although there is a lot of local brands who are still who have some sort of handmade element, but there are more of you know local brands. So it's yeah. kinda like made locally Yeah, support local businesses. Yeah, yeah, with pride. Um yeah and it's kinda like my dream to be in the Design Singapore yeah. space one day. And this Design Singapore location is in the middle of town. So it's within the arts district, which is sort of nearish to town. So this this location kind of straddles both. So it's kind of a really, really good location. But, and there's a very big but, <laughs> you have to rent the space in it. Uh, and so when you walk into Design Singapore, so Design Singapore is the name of the... The, the building or the yeah, location. The bu- yeah, the building location thingy. And when you walk in, it looks like a departmental store. Yeah. But it's all local brands. And you have to rent out. So if you're doing clothing or if you sew your own clothes, you need to rent a rack. Or if you're doing jewellery, you need to rent like a... Like a section. Like an island, yeah. yeah. And to rent a space, it costs almost $3,000 plus 10% GTO. And for those of you don't, who don't know what GTO means, that's uh, gross turnover. turnover. Yeah. And that's just basically your sales, right? Yeah. And they take 10% and above, I think, depending yeah. on... So that GTO, it's on top of what you pay mm-hmm. for the rental space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you're earning, you know, like 
$10,000, they take 10% of that. And I don't know if 10% is the number, but 10% is the minimum I've seen them charge. Yeah. I think there were some years it's like 15%, you know. So it it does cost a little bit to be a part of it. Um, but, you know, it's like it's something that I wish that we could do one day. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll look at bags. Or what. There was one year, though, that they had... Um, bags that were I think woven like hand woven ah, okay. so it's like weaving but with really chunky yarn I think right. like rope and it, it was there so when I saw that from afar I thought it looked like crochet right. and that was really when the idea that sort of struck me that yeah. oh my It'd be god we great could, yeah. if you know Crooked yeah. crochet could be could be there. Yeah. And I do see there are, I have I did try to submit an application once uh-huh. but I stopped when I saw the price tag. It was like two thousand nine yeah. and two thousand three thousand dollars was for a month. So you could choose I think you have to be in it for six months or like a the year. commitment period. Yeah, the commitment period, yeah, you're right. It's either six months or twelve months. Right. Um, because they don't want you switching out your brands mm-hmm. too soon, you know, they want to give it space or what. But six months for three thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Plus minimum of a ten percent GTO, that's that's too expensive for yeah. us. Yeah, I think in general rental uh, of spaces in Singapore, uh, be it malls or any on any in any other building, anything's pretty expensive mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. So I feel like we talked a lot about the space. <laughs> We're like what forty. 45 minutes in oh. but you know I feel like it's important to give you an idea of what the climate is here yes, regarding these markets you know so I'm going to quickly go through some organisers mm-hmm. so we have uh, Makers Market uh, we have organisers like Fleawear uh, the local people which I think they're not in operation anymore yeah. and Sunday Social Market and these these few people that I've mentioned they sort of work with different locations and different sometimes cafes yeah they collaborate with cafes with malls with, especially malls yeah yeah with convention centers with atrium place atrium centers um uh, or they you know like if there is like a festival like an art festival going on they they be sure to rent a space and then so when you contact them you are on their sort of list yeah uh, and they would just send you emails whenever there are events. So you just basically collect emails from them. Then you yeah. pick and choose which, uh, which event which you event, want to be. Yeah. Given that some of these organizers have a reputation of not having really good locations. Um, so you kind of just have to pick and choose which one you want to be a part of. So the reason why I'm not spending a lot of time talking about them is because you don't really know where they will put you up. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's in the middle of a financial district and I don't think bankers are about to walk past my shop yeah, and think I mean, oh I need a crochet <laughs> bubble tea holder I've seen know? locations that are like out right outside the, the train station for example mm-hmm. yeah and you know certain places aren't best for having like handmade stuff because people are just trying to get from one place to another Yeah. so that's kind of how it is like with the organisers I think if you want a greater success with your sales, it's better to approach events directly because you know the kind of people that will show up. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, like Public Garden, Etsy Craftivist, and these specific events draw a younger crowd and therefore they would be more open to wearing, you know, newer designs and they're more open to carrying like a crochet bag yeah. that's like a funky neon green colour. They're, they're more willing to experiment and yeah. that is really our sort of crowd. Yeah. So it really depends on what you're selling, um, but I think I think we've sort of mentioned At the least for bigger us, ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I guess for events, people uh, know that they are going, as in they have the intention of going there to see to sp- mm-hmm. and to spend. You know, mm-hmm. probably. Yeah. So I think we've covered majority. I'm sure there are more. It's just that these are all off the top of my my yeah, head the more common and uh, the bigger ones that are mm-hmm. uh, constantly running like promotions and events yes oh mm-hmm. uh, I will say once you are part of this circle once you are part of like the organizers sometimes organizers will disband <laughs> so half of the organizing team would break off and start their own right. own company yeah and then 
they start emailing you and then your number or your email starts getting spread around and you start getting you know like text messages of like independent people trying to create you know like a little market of their own um I will say that Mel and I are part of like a little vendors uh, group chat Mm -hmm. on WhatsApp with a few other makers that we have kind of been friends with over the years. Yeah. And these are people that we see regularly on, you know, on the, throughout the different events. And sometimes we joke about just creating our own (laughs) organizing and doing on our own, you know, and some one of our closer friends said, you know what I found out that we can just approach, you know, X, Y, Z, and then we'll just all band together and put the money in. It's much cheaper and, you know, we're not paying anybody else. Yeah, you're not exactly going through a third party, right? It's just that it will take so much work. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And who is the designated person that's going to be handling all this Mm. and then are they going to get more? So it's a little bit it's a little bit messier as of now, which is why we haven't tried to do anything on our own. But yeah, I think we've covered most of the places. So now let's move on to part two, where we talk a little bit more about our processes. So now now that you know uh, what's out there and what are the kinds of markets we can be a part of, now that's, that's where Mel and I come in. That's where we, we start to do the work. So in this section where now we are involved, we really have like split job roles. Yeah. And this is where Mel comes in more heavily. <laughs> heavily. In terms of operation wise, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I take a step back when it comes to this next few portions or next steps of the processes. Um, and I really only come back in when it's time to make the things. How easy my life is. <laughs> <laughs> well, not really because your portion, I would say, is more intensive. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, my is... Uh, more research and Mm -hmm. you know trying to make sure that we get you know the selected uh, markets that we want to attend to yeah so let's um let's walk our listeners through like let's walk you guys through the process of how it's like to even get started in the first place so i think i think one day mel and i were just walking past somewhere i think and we saw these art markets uh we saw one art market and i think that's when it sort of dawn upon us that hey we are a local brand we are handmade uh there's not many crochet brands out there i yeah. think we need to be doing this babe <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then i was like oh uh, we guess i guess we could look into it because yeah. you know in the business i am the one that comes up with the creative ideas mel just sort of supports the business um on an would you say like operational yeah point of view so i say we need to be doing this let's let's do this and she said, oh, okay. So it was quite difficult. Let's look at the numbers first. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she always says. Yeah. Um, so from from that, you see, you distracted me with the <laughs> let's look at the numbers. Oh, I, you know, every time you say that, it makes me think again. Like, Yeah, pause and think, which, you know, lucky we have that to kind of like pull <laughs> you back from all the excitement and, and, and all that, you know, so we don't, I guess, go overboard sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But my, my my response is we don't know if it will be worth <laughs> it if we don't try. <laughs> Which is true. I agree. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, in, like in this business, Mel is kind of my um, my ideas bought. The thrower sticker. I <laughs> we we used, you used that term before, right? I did, I did. In a previous <laughs> episode, I don't remember which one, I, I used the term idea thrower sticker at Mel. Yeah, I was a bit confused <laughs> at, at So let what me reintroduce <laughs> this label. So every time we have a new idea, I just basically throw my ideas at Mel, I talk it out with her, and if it sticks with her, then I go ahead and do it. But yeah. if she can immediately point out all the ways where she thinks it won't work and I have nothing to counter, then I know that this is really just my head in the clouds. <laughs> Which does not happen often, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's true. Yeah, usually you you will be able to give me really good uh, counter feedback. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's more that I have somebody, somebody to talk it out yeah. with. Because yeah. sometimes ideas sound so crazy in my head that like, I, I want to do this and this and this and this and this. And it's, I feel like I'm logical enough to know that I shouldn't just keep it in my head and go ahead. I need to speak to somebody and this sort of other like verbalize person, it, yeah. yeah, and this other person that I speak to will be able to validate in my mind mm-hmm. if I really thought through it properly. Right. It's just another step in the way yeah. of... Before you actually follow through and go with it. Yeah. yeah. So that's why Mel is my idea to throw a sticker. <laughs> True. I, I still cannot, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> so anyway, 
um, yep, so I said, let's do this. I think we need to do this. Yeah. So then Mel went back. And I think initially it was quite a process of looking for where to even begin finding email addresses to contact. Yeah, yeah. So, so mm. I think this is Mel's portion. So I'm going to let her explain. Yeah, so definitely at the beginning when you start off, it's about researching what are the different art mm-hmm. markets that is, you know, even in Singapore because it's not that common, you know. And we didn't have a podcast episode that we could <laughs> listen to that would tell us, oh, here are the names of yeah. organizers. Yeah, by the way, you know, you, you can search <laughs> them up. Contact this, this, yeah. this. Yeah, so I think that was the most difficult part in trying to figure out because even as you do and try to read more about it, they don't exactly tell you, okay, these are the organizer names. Mm -hmm. You, you know, uh, you go directly to them and things like that. Basically, there was no directory for us. Right. We had to, I think, read through articles that's like cosmopolitan articles that's like maybe like top five art markets in Singapore that you should be aware of or things to do this weekend on a long national yeah, holiday. So it, it was so, a lot of that. Yeah. Yep, so then we had to see through all these and specifically point out places, research these places and then see who, who the organisers were. And the organisers are... I would say, would you agree with me that if you're not in the circle, you you won't even know who they are? Yes, definitely, yeah. yeah. So, you know, finding them is one thing, then definitely joining their mailing list would be another, so mm-hmm. that, you know, I don't have to constantly, you know, keep catching up on what, what's happening, for example, next week or the month after yeah. that, and I get updated regularly. So I think our first introduction was with one of the organisers. I think we managed to find one of them. We put our name... Uh, we, I think Mel submitted an email and requested details for their upcoming anything. Yeah. Right? And then they said, oh, it's nothing's on ha- at the moment, but we'll put you on the mail- mailing list or the waiting list or whatever. And then that's where we did our first event. And I think from there, it's, it's with talking to other people or having other people share information with us because now that we're doing our first art market, you know, we have a neighbouring stall that we're willing, that was you know, willing to talk to us. And if you've ever done fellow artists um, if you've ever done like been at the art market or art booths anywhere mm-hmm. you know it's a lot of sitting and waiting yeah. and most of the time you're talking to the other vendors yes, that are beside yeah. you so I think that's how we uh, that's how we first got our foot in the door so it was really thanks to Mel um, as of right now talking I actually don't really know what she did <laughs> all I know is that she said one day she came to me and said, okay, here's what I've done. I've, you know, contacted X, Y, and Z, and yeah. this is this, and I just went, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. Great. It's just really doing the initial, joining a lot of mailing lists, following a lot of uh, different events, mm-hmm. um, just randomly, uh, uh, you know, just joining a lot of, like, all the Instagram, all the social networks, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and see what comes in. Yeah, you know, and right. then trying to sieve out exactly what Who kind we of want art. to be a part of. Yeah, yeah, correct. And then after that, I think eventually, as we attended more and more um, art market, mm-hmm. um, there are sometimes the customers that come and view these art markets. They will give us like their name cards and things mm-hmm. like that. You know, and they see our brand, they like our brand, and we, you know, automatically became beca- become a brand that is on their list. Yeah, or that yeah. they recognize. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of these, like sometimes customers would approach us. Uh, looking for events for their own office space maybe they are like handling marketing and PR for their own company and they're looking to you know throw together like a little party for you know whatever it could be like a like a office anniversary or something so uh, and that's that's how we started doing more and more so now that it's out, out of the way, let's let's share with you the process of what we do and how we do it step by step. So because Mel has already put in all the work, we get sent emails all, all the time yeah. about, um, you know, like if there's anything upcoming, if there's like a big, say, national holiday that's coming, um, then there will be a lot of brands, a lot of organizers that say, oh, we're going to hold it at this place, this place, or that place, that yeah. place, and we get lots of emails. So those emails go through Mel. So she looks at them, uh, she highlights any that she thinks I would want to do it, like, and then she comes and tells me, like, this place is doing this, and would you consider doing that? Or sometimes if I happen to see the email, because we both have access to the work email, right, of course, so if I happen to see something and I think that we could potentially do it, then I'll talk to Mel, then she will go ahead and, you know, settle whatever email, contact who she needs to, and come back with me 
come back to me with the pricing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I mean, over time, you sort of establish the kind of criteria mm-hmm. that you have to go through, like location. You know, price is one of them. Uh, and definitely the period of when this event is happening. You know, yeah. is it you know in December, for example, where you can expect maybe a lot of uh, food, Christmas traffic? shopping, exactly. Yeah. So you know things like that we would consider first. Yeah. So all this is Mel's portion of things. So she would come back to me. She would tell me, "Hey, this is happening. Is this what you want?" Because I handle sort of the creative aspect as well as the marketing of the of the brand. And so she will check in with me because there are a lot of times. There are some, um, say, art markets mm-hmm. that I don't want to be a part, part of, of because yeah. I think it's not the right brand image. So then I would say yes or no, or sometimes I say yes, but she looks at the price and say, "Are you kidding me? <laughs> We're not doing this." So and you know it, it, it's not always about how much money we spend or we earn, but the numbers need to make sense. Makes sense, obviously. Yeah. You, know, you if, are doing a business at the end of the day. If the number doesn't make sense <laughs> for us, how are we going to continue this, yeah, right? That's true. And we can't be making a loss, but which sometimes we do. We don't always... I mean, it's not like we plan to make a loss, but sometimes we, we do. And then we learn that, okay, maybe this event is not so good. <laughs> yeah, those are part of the memorable experiences. Yeah. <laughs> In the next episode, we'll definitely share with you one of our first few experiences doing an art market. Yeah. We were all over the place, I tell you. Yeah. It was three days. Uh, I'll share it in the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. So then Mel comes in and checks with me. And then if I say, okay, let's do it. If after discussing, we both agree that it's good to do it. Yeah. Then I would say, yeah, okay, let's do it. And then Mel will go back and do all the difficult things like the, paying people. Yeah, submitting the application, fill, filling in the forms and things like that. Mm. So then Mel will be liaising with the organisers or the team or whoever the event, um, the EOs are. And she will liaise with them uh, regarding what information they need from us. Because a lot of times, if it's like Public Garden or Etsy Craftivist or Artbox, they promote for you yeah. as well on their social media. So that requires um, some, write-ups, yeah, some photos, pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So all that is done by Mel. And then uh, after she pays and gets confirmation that we're doing it, yep. then that's where I really come in. You know. So as of this point, it's just talking. And you know, because we're a couple and we live together and we work together, a lot of these conversations are held like in the kitchen. <laughs> you know, all <laughs> constantly like like anywhere throughout the house yeah or like when we are grocery shopping and then you know she's like checking her phone and her email and she goes oh they reply and then wherever we are we just start talking about yeah, work work mode yeah so from my involvement till this point is a lot of just listening to whenever she's talking to me so I don't actually sit down to do any work yet yeah yeah so then Here's the difficult part, or here is where the part starts to get a little bit chaotic and tricky. Depending on what event we do, we tailor our inventory list or our products list to match that crowd. Yeah. So for example, if we know we're doing public garden, um, say during Christmas time, then we like to put a lot of smaller items like $10 and below, you know, things that could be given as gifts, maybe not like bigger handbags or stuff, you know, and... We sit down, we look at our inventory together, we decide who is the crowd, what are they buying, we look at the their social media, we mm-hmm. look at the people who are buying, we're looking at their, their tagged photos on yeah. Facebook and yep. Instagram, we're seeing the things they like, and then together we decide what items do we have as part of our brand that we could make a lot more of and then bring to this event. Yeah, because so it, obviously we have so many different kind of things, so many types of uh, category and mm-hmm. we are not going to bring everything. Yeah, right? that's true. So, and we, we there's no point just bring the same thing to every event that yeah. people won't want to come and see. Yeah. So, maybe this is like a little tip for you guys. Tailor your products to match the event so that people, you know, customers who are returning always have something new something to new, see yeah. when they come. So at this time, I think we have about four to six weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, usually we have at least four weeks, like a full month yeah, that I can usually, work on. Yes. Right? So usually we start the process of this like two two months, like eight weeks before the actual event. And that's really when the organizers start um, announcing that this is open for like, it's like an open call for artists. 
Um, so I have about four to six weeks from the time we pay and get confirmation to the time the event starts. So that is usually the timeline of what it takes for me to be crocheting furiously all the different products that we want to make. Yeah. So Mel and I will sit down, we will pull out the different things we have, we decide how many of each we want, what kind of, you know, should I do more solid colours, should I do more variegated colours of, it could be anything, right? Yeah. So let, let's just give an example of like a crochet pouch. Um, there are some events we do that we know there are a lot of families and they're like older people, so we know that they like more plain colours. But if it's like a younger crowd and then we know they like the really crazy colours, then we'll do more variegated. So that's a lot of discussion between Mel and I, what we want yeah. to do. Uh, and depending on the product and material, how much we want to price them for. Yeah, I think the interesting part to note is how much discussion and mm -hmm. planning goes into it before we even start making for the products. Sure. Yeah. And so I always say that making it is just making it. Yeah. You know, it's the it's the putting together, curating a really nice, cohesive yeah. um, look on the table mm. that, that plays a really, really big part as well. So, okay, so then four to six weeks for me to make the products and also to advertise on social media that we'll be doing this. So that's usually on our Instagram. We're not very active on Facebook, to be honest. So it's usually Instagram and Instagram stories. Yeah. And then closer to the date, usually we would do like we would mock up. We do like a mock up table in our house. Yeah. We would set uh, up our mock props. Set up, yeah. Yeah, like a mock setup. And ready our props. We would dust off the old props and whatever <laughs> else we need. Um, and then we would decide how we want to do the layout. Yeah. Um, and throughout this whole four to six weeks, Mel is in constant contact with the organizers and they will also be, it's more like, it's actually it's more the other way around. They will be constantly emailing us about what updates are on the protocol. So that could be what the reporting time is, safety protocols, um, map of the maps of the location, yeah, where, our, and all that. Yeah, yeah. where our booth is located, the size, the dimensions of the space we're allowed. Um, also, the details of the loading and unloading bay. If you're, you know, driving a big vehicle, you can. You're only allowed to come between this time to this time, and you're allocated different timings. So, all this information gets given to us um, in intervals, as and in when the the I almost said designer <laughs> organizers has decided on them. Yep. So about two weeks to the date, we would have all the details finalized, and then we just show up. So uh, let me talk a little bit more about our props and our setup. Initially, when we first started, we were just grabbing whatever we had. Um, we did spend quite a bit of money of trying to buy tablecloths, of trying to buy... Um, Maybe like, some sort of uh, stand, you know, like to display stand, the items. Like a yeah. crate box, like wooden crates and things like that. But I think we have progressed to a point that we have really really clean um like cleaned up the process of how we get our props ready and whatnot yeah. so like i say initially we're just throwing things together we're just putting in whatever sort of bag uh okay not whatever but initially we're bringing it to the events in our I ikea bags yeah um and whatever other sort of like backpacks and Carriers, luggage yeah yeah and luggage was a common one that we used to bring it in our luggage but then it became like it became really apparent at the end of the very first flea or first event that we did uh the first art market that this the, the whole luggage thing is not going to work for us yeah we needed something a little bit better we had a lot of props a lot of jars a lot of um like table table cloths a lot of like hanging signs uh, hangers, racks. Yeah, a lot of props, yeah. It was insane. We tried to do everything. So then we decided that we needed to streamline and at uh, art markets, we could only promote a set number of things at one time so that the table doesn't become too yeah, overwhelming exactly. or messy. Yeah. So that's what we did. Um, and then over time, I managed to work with a, a woodworking artist and she managed to create I mean I sat down I talked to her about what I wanted what I needed and she managed to create like a flat pack 
a wooden platform and it's yeah. stained in like a really nice dark walnut stain. Yeah, which is what uh, our, we wanted our brand to sort of yep. look and feel like. Yep. Yeah. So if you see our brand in person, we have a certain look to our brand. Uh, we have a lot of dark walnut wood with gold tones. So our trays are gold trays. Our platforms are wooden, uh, like a walnut wood platform. We have like a light cream, uh, like a calico coloured a tablecloth to cover the table so the idea is a lot of dark woods and goals and like white cotton flowers yeah. you know that decorates the table so we focus a lot more now on making the table look nice and not so much about the product so we don't even put all the products we bring in a lot yeah. but we probably display about 40% of it or 40 to 50% depending on if the table has space and the type of layout of table they give us so right now we have about two big box containers yeah so they're like um like huge like two feet by one feet type containers huge ones and in one container is all of our props and in the other container is all of our products and all of the props includes um the flat pack wooden uh, shelving or table a uh, setup shelving that we talk about yeah and together with all our you know, like fairy lights or yeah, lights important trays, as well. Yeah, battery packs. We also have a file, uh, that has all our important documents. I bring a clipboard with all my custom order forms. You know, I have sample of yarn, and these are things uh, like measuring tape, for example. <laughs> yeah, man, the number of times. I've gone for an event and just didn't bring measuring tape. It was insane. So measuring tape, we have a pencil case, uh, and we have like a money box, mm -hmm. like a with a lock for and cash. key. Yeah, yeah. And we never leave that alone. Um, it's not. It's a lot easier now with cashless payment, and they yeah. can just send the money to you directly. But in the past, it was a lot of cash transactions. transactions yeah. Um, we always bring our iPad because we have uh we, the POS system that we use is Square. Uh, and Square is kind of it's quite common use in a lot of places mm. so we use Square for that uh, and we also do sometimes we check out on the website because our website is run by Wix.com so these are a little bit of what goes on behind the scenes for us and what we bring in our boxes we also have a little what's the word a uh, tr trolley ah right right to, to in order to move the yep. So we have boxes a, from one. We yeah. have a trolley that our boxes can stack on. So it's like a, a plastic board, a huge plastic board with four wheels. And then we just stack our boxes on top of it. And the boxes we have chosen, the containers, are specifically meant to stack on each other. Yeah. So it fits really nicely like Tetris. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's important to make sure like your setup process is easy yeah. and uh it's fast and quick, you know, mm -hmm. with not, not much fuss on mm -hmm. how you do the, the, the setup because you know that's the most important when you don't have that much time. True. So it's very easy for us. So and then we have a strap that just kind of cinches in and then we just roll that yeah, put anywhere. It all together yeah, just, it's on yeah. four wheels. We just roll it everywhere. So we're not dealing with luggage. We're not dealing with um, multiple bags at once. We do have our, our, sign, our signed poster with our brand logo that we bring with us. So that's the only thing we really carry. And then there's backpacks. Mm, yeah. And w w whatever snacks or water <laughs> we need to bring. Yeah. And that's, but that's in our personal bags, right? Yeah. So it's, very, it's a very simple process. So when we show up, we just open, we unclip the box, we literally open it, we take whatever whatever we need, we set up the table, and then the products get filled in later. Yeah. So depending on... Um, we have a general idea of how we like to set up the table. It's not always the same from one event to another, but we tend... Uh, we tend to try to keep it somewhat similar. The reason why it's a little bit different in every event is because we want to, you know, depending on where we're situated, mm -hmm. if we are smack in a corner, maybe we'll try to situate the shelf or the table such that it, it faces the yeah. the main section of the room. Yeah. So visually, it's not, you know, it doesn't hide or block the products or things like that. Yeah, that's right. So if we know we have a lot of people coming in from the left, we make sure we put our our flat pack box that is now neatly set up yeah. on the right of the table so that, you know, when they're walking visually, it's nice to see and it's yeah. easy, you know, the eye flows from one thing to another. Depending on what I want to 
showcase um, showcase mm-hmm. for that particular event that would be in the main center of the table. Yeah. And then the rest would just be on the peripherals, like yeah. on the, the edges. Yeah, and I guess sometimes we have like many smaller products. So I think mm-hmm. the size of your products also matters in how you kind of set up and lay out and how you know, you want when somebody comes to the store, it's very easy for them to, to visually browse. and to browse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And everything is within arm's reach. So no one's like reaching over each other. Right. So we spend a lot of time thinking about the process from the customer's point of view. Because yeah. before I am a maker, I am a customer for somebody else. Yeah, of course. And I like that process to be a bit seamless. So we spend a little bit of time... Um, trying to figure out the layout mm-hmm. and then you know I think it's quite funny because when I'm doing that I'm really like deep in concentration <laughs> I'm like talking to myself I'm trying to I'm shifting things around and Mel just takes a step back because if she talks yeah, to give me give her her space yeah <laughs> I think it's really funny because if Mel talks to me then I'll be like Shh, I would be really snappy <laughs> yeah. and you know like Shh, yeah. what do you leave want leave me alone what do you want <laughs> leave me alone I'm busy <laughs> So it's definitely tense, especially when I know I'm racing against time. Yeah. You know, like the doors are going to open to public in, what, 20 yeah. minutes? You know, and, and I yeah. still have to set up. I still have to go pee. I have to turn on my <laughs> iPad, set up a system, yeah. you know. And and to be fair, we usually have friends who are willing, more than willing to come help us. So then it's also trying to explain to them, once the setup is done what the flow is like, you know, what you should promote, what you should say. Um, Am I missing anything? (laughs) I think more often or not, sometimes, uh, even midway during the event, you can decide to change the layout, Mm -hmm, you know, sometimes that happens. And also another thing is, say for example, if I have 20 crochet pouches, Mm -hmm. depending on how crowded the table looks visually, I maybe only display five or six. Yeah. And then if somebody comes and picks up, you know, a crochet pouch and say, oh, I like this, then I would offer the information that I have more colours if you want to see. And so because we have our boxes that is now stacked up neatly beside us, yeah. that's usually under the table, so that it's really easy for me to just Open pull out and a reach bunch. Out, yeah. Yeah, we kind of know where everything is, mm-hmm. is, right. And the way we have sectioned things in the box is also pretty organised. Mm-hmm. We have, um, like, Ziploc baggies, and I put all, like, large, like, uh, what was it? Like, pint-sized Ziploc baggies. And each category of product goes into one Ziploc baggie. Yeah. And we have big stickers on the outside that says, uh, crochet pouches. Or another one would be, like, crochet keychains or whatever so it's very easy to just pull out the Ziploc baggies as and when based on what what the name you see and then show it to them that way so yeah that's a really I think it's a really simple process and at the end of the day when we're done usually these places some of the places are uh, they have a guard um, and the doors close so it's like in an indoor area so if it's an indoor area they allow you to keep your things there because the premise will be closed will be locked up yeah Yeah. some people still bring it back sometimes we bring our stuff back because I just don't think it's safe but we leave our props on the table so we dismantle but it's on the table and then we have a big cloth that we just cover over it yeah if it's like an outdoor area they tell you that there will be security guards patrolling but you leave your stuff there at your own risk. Yeah, of course. So if it's an outdoor area, we try not to. To leave anything behind, yeah. yeah. But if it's like, say, within a convention center and the doors are locked up and then the mall is locked up, then usually we feel quite safe to leave our things there. In general, it's pretty safe in Singapore. I don't know whether you've seen... Um, I don't know if you guys know anything much about Singapore, but it's a place where you could leave your laptop on a cafe table tell the table beside you, hey, watch my stuff, and then go to the bathroom and come back 10 minutes and later. And still there. <laughs> and your stuff will still be there. Yeah. People actually return your wallets here. <laughs> that's, how, <laughs> that's how safe Singapore is. Like, no one closes their bag when they walk around. Yeah. There's virtually no pickpockets. Um, and if your stuff does get stolen, it's probably by kids who are playing a prank or whatever. So it's really safe here to do that, which, you know, you could walk home at 2 o'clock in the morning drunk, in a rowdy <laughs> district and still get home safe. Oh, Whiskey. <laughs> whiskey. He just woke up from his nap, so that sound you heard was him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's our process. 
of how we set up for an event and how we've got it down. So it's, this is so much easier having this box system. It's so much easier than digging in bags or trying to open your luggage. Your luggage you yeah. know, because, you know, opening luggage is not that simple, I think. Especially when you have props. And our props are made of solid wood, so they're really heavy. Um, like, he- they're heavy props, basically. Yeah. And I have, like, glass bottles, and I have flowers. I have, like, dried cotton flowers that I display um, beside my signboard. Yeah. Oh, and I have a signboard, <laughs> a wooden signboard, yeah. uh, on top of, like, a hanging a hanging poster of my yeah. logo. So, so there's, like, really odd-shaped props, or mm-hmm. props that may be very fragile, mm-hmm. and, and things like that, where if you have a box system, it just storage why is it so much easier and better? Yep, I agree. So that that's that's our setup for us. So that's our that's our process also from how we start mm-hmm. to to like all the way to the end. So let me give you guys an idea now. I know we're running a little bit past the one hour mark, but I'll just quickly end with how it feels like for us on the day of event. Mm-hmm. So usually on the day of the event, we're up really early. <laughs> I want to say sometimes we don't sleep, but we're usually really sleep deprived because you're working right up to the night off. Yeah, for because sure. Because on our square, on our POS system, on our, our sales, how would you describe POS system? Uh, basically where you do your point of sales, right? Yep. So, so you POS store... just means point of sales, yeah. yeah. So it's where we check people out, it's where we key in our sales, mm-hmm. um, it's where we... You Record know... uh, the payment method, mm-hmm. things like that. And where we also keep track of our inventory right. per event. Mm-hmm. So we, oh, I, I'm usually crocheting to the morning off sometimes. Uh, I very rarely... I'm done actually, I'm very rarely done days before it usually I'm like crushing right up to the night off <laughs> I was about to say you rarely take a break <laughs> <laughs> that, that's also true but that's also you yeah. <laughs> just because you tell me to take a break often doesn't mean that you don't yeah. work a lot too <laughs> so anyway um, usually we're sleep deprived I will probably be working right up to the morning off I would sleep a little bit you know and then we would wake up bright and early to head to this whatever our location would mm-hmm. be uh, we would have packed it already the night before so everything is zipped up nicely Mm -hmm. stationed by the door ready to go out and the reason why we're usually sleep deprived is because Mel doesn't count inventory with me until after I'm done with making products because sometimes I could think I'm done and then I have just enough yarn to squeeze in another (laughs) whatever it is and then I do that so we don't actually know the number of say pouches we're bringing until I'm fully done and my cutoff point is the morning of the event. Yeah. So that's where we will sort of rush to do it. But everything is ready, sort of ready to go. Mm-hmm. It's just king in numbers into the POS system. Right. So that's what we do. So we wake up bright and early. We have coffee at home. <laughs> For sure, yeah. We use the toilet because a lot of times these spaces don't have ready available toilets. Yeah. yeah. We use the toilet. Um, if we have time the day before we would maybe grab some sandwiches from like the local store and then bring it with us but a lot of the times we don't have time for that so we eat a little bit of something in the house Yeah. if we have time for that and then we rush straight off because we know we're not taking any breaks once we're there yeah for sure so we hire a car uh, or grab an Uber to the event and then we show up we register our name at the door then they tell us where they put us so we don't always get a chance to choose where Where we're located say for public garden for example it's allocated based on like a bidding process or a balloting process so you kind of are placed randomly Mm -hmm. yeah but we've been doing it so long with them that we kind of know the general area of where we'll be. Mm-hmm. Usually we're on either ends of the aisle uh, because that's where they put all the hand meat or the, the crochet, the non-jewelry stuff. So yeah. that's, that's or, where we'll be. Um, yeah, or like fashion wear stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then after we get registered, uh, they will lead us to our booth uh, and then we'll set up. So from that point, we usually have about an hour and a half to two hours mm-hmm. to set up. Usually, yeah. Yeah, so we try to get it done as soon as possible so that we can, you know, make a last minute run to the bathroom or go grab coffee in case we're done with it or something. Because usually from the point we set up to the point the the public or the customers start walking into this place, 
we're not leaving any anytime soon. No, no, yeah. Yeah, and it's never it's it's impossible to do it as a one person team, or at least that's my um, th- th- that's how I feel. I think it's you know we've ever had we've had um event or, or, or a booth somewhere once that there was like seven eight people talking to all to us at the at, same time at the yeah. same time, and it was it was so overwhelming because it was just Mel and I. And if you've ever had to deal with a lot of customers talking to you at one time, you know they can be quite demanding, some of them. And, mm-hmm. you know, it crochet is not something that you can explain and make a sale in a minute or so. Right. You know, it takes time to explain to them what mm-hmm. it is, how to care for the product, um, if it's dirty, how should you wash it, you know, the like different ways you can use it or yep. whatever, whatever, whatever. And the question I always get is, is it safe? What happens if the if a tail sticks out or yarn right. or like, you know, basically there were a lot of questions when it comes to crochet. So it was overwhelming. <laughs> and I don't think it's a one person job. Yeah, it's really hard if you if you are the only one. Yeah. It, it's possible, but it's really hard. So you know, early in this episode I mentioned that I wasn't around for this past public garden that happened and Mel had to do it alone. So yeah. I mean it's it's your first time doing it alone, yeah, right? Yeah. So maybe you can share about how your experience was because I definitely wasn't there to help you. Uh, yeah, the thing is that you are so focused on manning the store, you don't, you, you can't take a break, you know, mm-hmm. it's really hard for to even like rest or, you know, to take a water break and things like that. Um, or go to the bathroom, yeah, that's the worst yeah, I point. guess you don't really even think about it until at the end of the event, you know. But was there a lot of people talking to you at once? This time round, I do feel like we had a lot more uh, younger crowd mm-hmm. and they are so excited i don't know whether it's because of the trend of crochet but it probably is yeah yeah. they're so excited to talk about crochet so they'll come and ask you like a lot of things about your experience you know why you do it what do you do and it's a lot of talking this Mm -hmm. this time around that's why i feel i think um and i so also to give some background information like our child nathan was there but he's a 14 year old teenage boy he's not interested and he is not somebody that talks a lot. He's a very quiet boy, yeah, yeah. quite introverted. Yeah. So, you know, to get him to raise his voice, <laughs> it's like oh, it's like asking like heaven and asking him to move heaven and earth, you know, just to raise his voice and speak. So he's always mumbling like a teenage boy. <laughs> and it's just, he's of no help. <laughs> he yeah, may be, sadly. Yeah, he may be there physically, physically but yeah. all he really does is help watch that no one steals the money yeah. <laughs> or, or yeah. something like that. Yeah, and I I guess this time round we also had a lot of customers coming up to us to ask about classes, mm-hmm. you know, because I think uh, like school holidays were approaching, and uh, uh, you know parents wanted you know their their kids, kids to, to be, sign up yep. for classes, and classes need a lot of explanation, mm-hmm, and right. they, usually parents have a lot of questions, yep. right? So, I can imagine. I'm so glad that I wasn't there having to deal with it because to be very honest, uh. I am very, very private and introverted yeah. and talking to people stresses me out sometimes. Yeah. So that's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I had to do a lot of that. But, you know, this is not, I know, our first uh, art Rodeo. market. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was very comfortable doing it and I, I know all the information so it wasn't too difficult for me. But yes, it was tiring. Uh, I, I guess the only instruction I gave uh, my nephew, like Nathan, was to just stand there, smile and say hello, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, that's the least he could do, which... Yeah, I guess it was helpful enough. As long as he doesn't get distracted by all the pretty girls, <laughs> all the pretty teenage girls, because yeah. when he came back to tell me about it, he kept saying, oh, there was like a young girl, like a pretty, <laughs> really? like my Did age, looking yeah. at the bag, you know. I think like girls like that that kind of bags. And I, <laughs> and so as I'm listening, like his... That all was his, his only feedback. His, yeah, his only feedback was like, girls like these kind of things. I'm like, well, I'm a girl. Are you saying that I would like these things? And he's like, oh no, uh, they can't be old. They have to be my age, right, you know? Right, So it's like, he's of no help, really. <laughs> so anyway, what we're saying... Oh yeah, so at that point, it takes about two hours to set up. Um, and this whole time, it's usually pretty chaotic because we're not the only ones setting up. Yeah. Uh, Pre-COVID sometimes people can be really nasty um, especially the the stalls or the makers to your either left or right mm-hmm. because pre-COVID they would really pack 
the tables right. pretty close to each other so you don't have much space basically and when you're setting up if you've ever set up for an art market you know that things are everywhere and yeah. things have to get messier before they become neater or, yeah. or clean or whatever so in the process of setting up it looks like a hurricane hit right your bags are <laughs> yeah. open there's things everywhere you know yeah. you're you're busy looking for this and yeah. you're setting things up and you're switching things around so it's never a neat yeah, process it's really chaotic yes and if you don't have nice neighbors they can really make life difficult for yeah. you you know yeah. some some of them can be really passive aggressive like they will use their licks to kick your things apart yeah or try to hog up extra space for themselves yeah, or push their table forward a little yeah. bit you don't want to you know your props or your racks or you know to kind of eat up into their space mm-hmm. so they get really sensitive about things like that yeah yeah it's a lot better now post covid because there is no choice but to have safety distance yeah safety distancing between all the tables so there is so much space this year as compared to to previously yeah mm-hmm. which is why they're also charging a lot more money per booth right because it's a lot less less people uh, yeah swimming brands yeah yeah so that's how it's like um, I mentioned earlier that we usually have people come help us that's usually either one of my best friends or one of Mel's best friends and they would come um, they won't be there to set up with us but they would show up and bring food and we're really lucky yeah. that we have quite sociable friends and people who we're, we're, we have we have really supportive people around us so usually on my private Instagram I would post and say I will be at this place at this time from this time to this time yeah. bring food <laughs> or you know yeah. bring coffee and then people would just show up yeah. with food <laughs> And coffee, it's and like, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's like uh, the most natural thing for them to do. Like, here, I got this for you. Yeah. And yeah. And it's multiple people bringing food. So, you know, we don't have to worry so much about food or drinks. But there are some times or there are stretches of time where we are alone and there is nothing to do. And, you know, there is like a, a lull in the crowd, which there always will be. Mm-hmm. Uh, there will be a couple hours or so where there's not many people and then there will be a sudden rush of people yeah. especially before and after lunch hour mm-hmm. so then it's in that lulls in that you know quieter moments that it can be a bit tiring because you're sitting there you're sleep deprived you've just had a very very chaotic morning and when people come to your booth to talk to you you've got to be Hello, how are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You bring that kind of energy, right? Yeah, you can't do the, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Hi, how are you? Please browse my table. I've had a, a hectic morning. Please <laughs> just browse. I mean, you can't do that, right? Yeah. So after all that, I, or at least for me, I kind of have to emotionally psych myself to say, okay, this mm. is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to take. If I need to, you know, step back and run to the bathroom to hide because I'm socially overwhelmed. And then I will yeah. let Mel know and then she will take over. So it's, yeah. I kind of have to psych myself a little bit. Yeah. But sometimes I do like the down moments mm-hmm. when it comes uh, because it gives us a chance to kind of walk around the whole uh, area to talk to the other vendors. Or, that's true. That's or, true. Yeah. You know, to like you know make friends in that sense and Mm -hmm. we've made really good you know friends through these events and we will talk about this in the next episode because this is something i'm excited to talk about you know the 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 really good parts about about you know doing events like that um and i will say that we've made some really 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 good friends with some of the vendors and other like makers and artists that we have seen or familiar faces that we always see. Yeah. We've become really, really great friends. So that's the, the plus that's a big side, plus yeah. about doing all this. So anyway, I think I think we've mostly covered it, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would say so. This is one of the long, longer <laughs> episodes. If we if I feel like we've missed out anything uh, we will bring forward to the part two. We'll yeah. It, yeah, we'll bring it up in the next episode where we talk about the pros, the cons, and our experiences. Mm-hmm. Because I, you know, I think we are starting to talk a little bit more about our, our experience already. Right, right. So, yeah, that's our process. And you know, to pack up, it's we just literally do the reverse. Yeah, we put our things back in the boxes. We call an Uber and we go home, and, and then we sleep. <laughs> yeah. So usually the. The night we come home, we don't do anything. We literally leave the boxes by the door and we just appreciate being home. Yeah. We hug the dog, <laughs> we play with the cat. We, I don't know whether we have dinner. I don't think we have dinner usually. Yeah, usually we just knock out, I think. Yeah, 
But then the next day, we will go through, we'll check the inventory, we'll make sure the money all tallies, we'll make sure that we pay who we need to pay. Uh, we check how much we earn, which is unfortunately maybe not a lot, but we can share this in the next episode. Um, and then I start getting to work on custom orders, which we usually always get custom orders. Yeah. Um, and then my turnover time is one either one to two or two to four weeks, mm-hmm. depending on how many orders I get. Yep. Um, and I make sure to mark on my piece of like order form uh, what the turnover time is that I told the customer. So I'll work on the ones first there. Initially, I said one to two weeks. Yeah. So by the second day, I'll be like, oh, two to four weeks. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that's that. And then once that's done, I pack up. Uh, I mail all the. I dispatch mm-hmm. the things via courier to these people. And then we start the process all over again. Yeah. That's about it. And that is it to our process. Like I said, no gatekeeping. We're going to share everything. So um, I'm sorry if this episode has been overwhelming with a lot of information. And I don't know if we're clear with any of the information or maybe we're not that clear. But either way, if you're confused, you can always send us a message, especially if you're based in Singapore and you want to know a little bit more of the details Mm -hmm. about who to contact. Um, I'm not going to be giving you email addresses to these people. I think you need to contact them yourself, but we can at least point you in the right Right direction. direction. You know, if you want any other tips about preparing for art markets or, you know, the creative process behind it, because... I don't think I talked a lot about my creative process mm. yet. Yeah. Because for the four to six weeks in between, it's it's crazy crocheting. It's like yeah. crazy crochet time, you know? Mm-hmm. So if you have any other questions, you should contact us on Instagram or Facebook. But don't do not do it on Facebook, just we're never on Facebook. We are on Instagram at Crooked Crochet SG. You can WhatsApp us at plus six five nine one two seven two seven four three. Just drop us a message, tell us, hi, you're coming from the podcast and just ask whatever you want to yeah. ask. Or you can email us at crookedcrochetsg at gmail.com. If you are not from Singapore, I hope that this was an interesting glimpse yeah. into how um, our art market scene is like. If you ever want to do an event here, uh, feel free to contact me and maybe we'll do a meetup. You know, I don't know how I'll be able to help, but it'll be fun to meet some of you guys yeah. also. If you ever want to do art markets here, I don't think there is any laws restricting foreign brands. As long as you pay the amount and you show up, I don't right. really think they care. <laughs> Um, Yeah, but I hope that if you're not from Singapore, this will at least give you a little glimpse because Mm -hmm. I think uh, we are quite a unique place because we are so small geographically uh, that we have our own like processes and things. It's kind of foreign to a lot of... It's not even the same concept. Like we don't even have farmer's markets. Come on. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. it's really different. Yeah. Yeah, so I hope that this has been interesting for you. In the following week, we will be back to talk about the pros and the cons Mm -hmm. of doing these art markets, you know, like the things we love about it, the things we hate about it, the really difficult parts, and, you know, maybe not, I wanted to say grim reality, but not not so drastic. Yeah. Just maybe the the real things that go on behind the scenes and it's not as so it's not so simple. It's just Or straightforward, yeah. Or straightforward. You know, there are a lot of difficult ways that we have to handle um, other vendors mm-hmm. or organizers yeah. or you know like certain organizers are known for certain things and maybe we can share some of our experiences. Yeah. Some of our really bad experiences. Um uh, and also our good, good ones, ones I yeah, think yeah for sure yeah but all the good ones are kind of the same like oh we showed up we had lots of sales there lots of people came by I mean everybody already knows what the best experience was I have to say some of the worst experiences I learned the most mm-hmm. and so I think those are the ones I would want to share right you know, because those are the ones that end up being really memorable to me because yeah. of you know it's just different yeah. we will get to that in the next episode so Don't forget that the next episode will be back the following Sunday. We are no longer doing weekly episodes. It's every two weeks so that we can have a little break in between. And it will be the following Sunday. Yeah. So from now to then, stay safe, everybody. And we'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Bye. Bye.